Our next presenter is an evolutionary biologist and an assistant professor in Georgia Tech's School of Biological Sciences. In 2016, Popular Science featured him in its brilliant 10 list, honoring the brightest young minds reshaping science and the world. In his lab, Ratcliffe performs evolutionary time travel in a test tube by creating new multicellular organisms from single cell yeast and algae. And tonight we will see if he can rise to the occasion and explain life's big evolutionary step in five minutes or less. Uh, and so please welcome Will Ratcliffe. Thank you, and I should say it was incredibly hard to do a five minute talk. I've probably spent far more minutes or hours on this than I would on a, a normal 45 minute talk. Um, all right, so I would like you guys to do a little thought experiment with me. I want you to imagine what the world would be like if there were no multicellular organisms. So close your eyes and uh, imagine that you're in a beautiful forest. The light is streaming down, it's hitting your face. You uh, hear birds chirping, uh, the buzz of insects. All right, get rid of the trees, the ferns, the understory plants, those are all multicellular organisms. Chuck them out. You hear a flapping as the birds fly away. There's a, a rain of insects as they fall down. Those are multicellular animals, get rid of those. What's, what's left? Uh, probably mushrooms, lichens, multicellular fungi. Get rid of those. If we got rid of all of Earth's multicellular organisms, we would have a planet that looks like a greener, wetter version of Mars. So multicellularity was a key step in the origin of complex life on Earth, but it's been a difficult one to study, and we actually don't know that much about how single-celled organisms first made those evolutionary steps to becoming multicellular ones. And that's largely because this is sort of a very ancient thing. It happened uh, in some lineages hundreds of millions of years ago, in other lineages billions of year years ago. So rather than trying to figure out what happened on Earth, in our lab we are trying to evolve novel multicellular organisms that have never existed to study this process. The main model organism that we use is baker's yeast, which is a single-celled fungus. And um, from that we've evolved snowflake yeast, which are a multicellular fungus. Uh, it's derived from those ones up top. And it contains, each group contains hundreds of cells. They have this beautiful three-dimensional fractal growth pattern. And they even have a simple life cycle where they pop off little baby snowflakes. And those snowflakes grow up to their parent size and then they begin reproducing their own. So from this, we have learned that there are sort of two key steps to evolving multicellularity. The first is that single cells need to evolve to form groups. Now in nature, this may occur if you have predators that can eat single cells but have a hard time fitting big groups in their mouth. This is actually what's occurring here. These are rotifers, and they've been gorging themselves on red-labeled single-celled yeast. You can look into their gut and see that it's mostly red. Uh, but they're really having a hard time eating the blue-labeled snowflake yeast. <laughs> now, <laughs> well, we don't actually use these rotifers very often in the lab because they're kind of a pain. They might die on you. They, you know, they don't even like the same media as, as, as yeast do. So instead, we evolve our snowflake yeast by using a race. We put them in a test tube and we select on them to get to the bottom of the tube faster than anyone else. And big groups get there first and so they survive and if you're a slow single cell, you're thrown in the garbage can. <laughs> now, it's pretty easy genetically to form a group for yeast. There's one gene whose job it is, is to regulate cell-cell separation. And we keep seeing mutations popping up in this gene. And uh, it turns out that, yeah, if you knock this gene out, a single cell yeast begins growing as a snowflake. We can do cool little tricks where we take a snowflake that evolved in a test tube and fix that gene and bring them back to unicellularity. So genetically, getting a group is pretty easy. The next step is a little more tricky. Here, whole groups of cells have to begin evolving as an individual, becoming more complex by gaining small, uh, accumulating a, a large number of, of small multicellular adaptations. And we can actually watch this process occurring in laboratory experiments where we put our yeast, for, yeast through thousands of generations of evolution. So this is a 1,000 generation experiment. And again, we're selecting for our yeast to make it to the bottom of a test tube fast. And guess what? They get better at doing that, which is, which is good. Otherwise, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> but it turns out that it's not a trivial thing for them to do that. Because in order to get faster settling and bigger, they need to figure out how to circumvent space constraints. You can't just keep adding cells to the group because pretty soon you have nowhere else to put them. So one of the first things they evolved to do is to form more elongate cells, which actually pack more efficiently in three-dimensional space, letting them make more cells per group. Turns out that snowflake yeast figured this out after about eight weeks, 
and human physicists took 400 years since Kepler <laughs> to figure this out. So there are you know, millions of them working on the problem. So. Another thing they figured out is how to harness the power of cellular suicide. That might seem counterintuitive. Why would we want ourselves to commit suicide? But everybody in this room right now has cells that are undergoing programmed cell death. That's actually really important. It keeps you, keeps you relatively cancer-free, helps you maintain your organs. Snowflake yeast harness the same behavior, but here, when a cell dies, it actually results in the birth of a new baby snowflake. Because when you break one cell in that chain, you pop off a branch. And it allows them to basically control their, their reproduction a little more. We also find that snowflake yeast can make, their, make themselves more hydrodynamic. All right, so broadly speaking, we find that multicellularity can evolve much more readily than previously thought, which sort of is relevant to a big question about the, about the potential for complex life elsewhere in the universe. Oh my god! All right, let me say... Can I say one final thing, which is if you, if you know anybody that really wants to evolve their own snowflake yeast, we have a curricula and a kit, and we will send you for free snowflake yeast, and you can, you can have a high school-age kid of yours make their own. Major transition. <laughs>